Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. As the world digests the WikiLeaks revelations about Washington's secret nightmares, dreams and hopes, we're going to be reflecting on the world as it might have been and messages in bottles from unfamiliar places. Later on, we're going to hear from one of the new stars of the Turkish novel, the best-selling Elif Shafak, about spiritual dreams and from the astrophysicist Vicky Caspi about pulsars and neutron stars leaking light messages from deep space. But we're going to start with two of the countries still of enough interest to US diplomats to feature in those WikiLeaks leaks. Egypt's ruler Hosni Mubarak's quoted as inveighing against the liars of Iran. But Egypt itself was once thought to be a rising power in the region. Tariq Osman, author of Egypt on the Brinks, with me to discuss what went wrong. And we're going to start with Russia. Francis Spufford's novel Red Plenty homes in on that moment in the late 1950s, early 1960s, when diplomatic messages were discussing the possibility that the Soviets were about to overtake the West, not merely in missiles, but in consumer goods as well. Uh, Francis, it was a sort of now forgotten moment, certainly in the West, but it wasn't just in the West that there was this sense of optimism. Russians felt it too. Um, yes, I think it was. R- it was real optimism. Um, partly it was just Russians comparing a better present with a, with a truly grim recent past. Um, but because of that, I think they were willing just for a little while to, to, to believe the regime's promises that the future would go on getting better and better and better until it reached something like the kind of the dream of plenty which, which Marx had described, an end to history in which, in which everyone would have so much of enough they didn't even have to measure it anymore. Yeah, and you, um, you you feature Khrushchev himself as a rather sympathetic character in many ways in this book, somebody who has gone through the ghastly years of the sort of the famines and the slaughters and the massacres, and who hopes it will be worth it. Important to remember that he's someone who, who who partly caused the ghastly years of the famines and the slaughters. What what fascinates me about Khrushchev is that he appears to be that very rare thing, a monster with a with an intact conscience, um, mm. and I think he. He, he dreamed of and, and yearned for and committed the country to, to utopia partly as a way of settling his internal moral scores with himself. The future had to be wonderful because it was the only thing which would justify the past. I've broken all those eggs, so it better be one heck of an omelette that we're producing. Exactly. Um, it, Soviet omelette making committed to 300% <laughs> improvement under Khrushchev. <laughs> now, explain to us, just to draw us a little picture of your, uh, I suppose, main anti-hero or hero, um, who you describe as a genius. He was a genius. This is a man called Leonid Vitalievich Kantorovich, who was the only Soviet citizen ever to win the Nobel Prize for economics. Lots and lots of physicists and, and mathematicians, um, but very few economists. He, he came up independently at, at, a, at a dark moment of, of, of Stalinism with a piece of mathematics which... Um, is in use all over the world now, improving the operations of, of multinational companies, for example. But he thought it was the secret to making a planned economy purr along like a, like a, like a finely tuned machine. It was about op- optimal inputs and outputs, how to get the most out of the least, as it were. It was. It was a, it was a, a way of introducing or reintroducing frugality into into the planned economy, a way of finding a logic inside it which could be, which could be exploited to, to, get, to get more from the same or, or the same from, from less. And it actually got political backing um, during the Khrushchev time and it looked for a while as if it was going to become the basis for, for a new mathematical, cybernetic Soviet Union. Um, and my book is partly about why that didn't happen. And it didn't happen really because of the politics of a cruddy regime. Yes, um, because... I put it simply. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to disagree with you. I think the Soviet Union was a horrible country and, and, and um, a horrible country with gleams of idealism in it which have to be, to be accounted for. Basically, they were, they, were, they were stuffed because they had committed themselves under, under Stalin to a form of industrialization which was hopelessly, intrinsically tyrannical and they could not really change the software. The hardware was such that you could not run clever, delicate, um, intellectual little programmers for producing consumer plenty on it. Steel, concrete, yes. Musical boxes and, and happy ever after, no. 
and it's a book where you have all sorts of you have the young lovers and you have um, private life appears and all the rest of it and you have a, a singer songwriter who's morally uh, corrupted and so on but for a novel you've got quite a lot of people who do things i mean manufacturers and and uh, local program uh, lo local sort of soviet um, uh, commissars and so on working on the the basis it's, it's quite unusual to have a novel that's so much about stuff and making things isn't it one of the things that perpetually puzzles me about novels is why there's so little work in them i know this is probably that's exactly well, that's what i was trying to say rather badly yes it, maybe it's a defect partly of the english novel and some kind of gentlemanly residue left in it but it seems to me that that work occupies about about a third of people's lives, and novels should should be enthusiastic about it. So while I wanted this book to, to do justice to a complicated piece of history, I also wanted it to get into the fabric of of the middle bit of, of people's days in the Soviet Union. So yes, it's got a lot of people going to the office and working in factories and hospitals and, and, mm. and things. I wanted I wanted it to have the texture of life because political <coughs> ideas only really become interesting once you see them dragging their way through through people's lives. The oil and the dust and the things that don't work and the, the industrial sabotage and all the rest. The other thing that's um, surprising in a novel is the footnotes. I mean, you've got pages and pages and pages of detailed footnotes, presumably because you're trying to say to people, this actually happened, this bit really happened, this bit I made up. You're very um, punctilious about telling the reader which bits are entirely made up, which bits actually took place. This is partly me keeping a promise to my mother, who is a proper historian, that if I made things up, I would actually tell people where the making up began. Um, but it's also because... We can call this book a novel, but it's actually some kind of weird compromise between a novel and non-fiction because I did want to convey something that really happened mm. but using storytelling to do it. I wanted it to be full of dialogue <laughs> and people you'd like to spend time in company with and good jokes and all the other pleasures of novels, but it's it's still it's idea-shaped. It's Absolutely, and it quotes a lot from official Soviet documents and newspapers and so on. Uh, you don't speak Russian, but it did strike me that this is a book that needed to be published in Russia. Is it going to be... Are Russians going to read it? To my astonishment, it's being translated into Russian and will be coming out sometime towards the end of next year. I'm still mystified about why Russians need it, because a lot of what I've done here <coughs> has been to find ways to spell out for Western readers and people like me... Um, the things which went without saying in the Soviet Union, the obvious is always one of the hardest things to, to get into. But maybe, maybe Russians are, are nostalgic for this previous version of the obvious. Absolutely. We're going to come on to talk to you about Egypt in, in a moment. But, Tara Gosman, it did strike me there were lots and lots of parallels uh, between Egypt and Russia. There were so many economies around the world which looked at this moment of red plenty, bought the story and thought, we're going to do the same. Absolutely, actually. Uh at one point in time during the, the height of, of the dream in, in the 50s and 60s of, of Nasser's time in Egypt, um, Egypt looked to, to the Soviet Union not only to supply arms and, and, and munitions and what, what, what the likes, but for the building of the high dam, the, the fourth pyramid in Egypt, as they say, which was effectively a piece of, of master Soviet engineering and, uh, and lots of funds and economics going into it. And during the height of that Nasserite experience, loads of Egyptian engineers and, and managers looked to the Soviet economy as their role model. Um, mm. And I find it quite interesting because unlike in, in the US and Europe, actually loads of segments in the Egyptian middle class looked at Moscow and Leningrad at that time mm. as... Uh, as the Paris, if this you is like. a scene in Francis's book where where they're looking outside a taxi and lots of sort of Africans and <laughs> Egyptians and people from all around the world are congregating and one forgets that Moscow used to be a sort of international metropolitan hub, for, certainly not now. Um, yes, it was it was it was the cosmopolis of of, of half the world for a little while, um, and. We have to remember that, that the Soviet model was a, was a model of being modern. It was a, it was a rival version of the twentieth century, um, which crashed, but but for a while seemed to offer, particularly I think in countries like Egypt, a kind of shortcut to getting there. And also, it let you thumb your nose at the West, which must have been terribly, terribly satisfying. Mm. Elif, I was wondering as a novelist whether you agreed that work doesn't feature in novels. 
very much. And this is a surprising thing. I, I suppose it's quite hard to, to, to dramatise it sometimes. It is. It is a surprising thing. I mean, given the fact that it occupies such an important you know, part of our lives, daily lives. Yes, I agree. I mean, uh, work is not being reflected enough in, in, in you know, novels. But again, this is a big generalisation at the same time. Then there mm. are novels, particularly some non-Western novels in which work does occupy an important place, uh, especially, you know, if you're talking about peasants, you know, factory workers. So there is that. But when you look at the general picture, I think you're very right. Mm. And and Vicky, we're going to be talking um, about the cosmos in a different way. But I suppose another interesting thing about the Soviet Union in this era, it was one of the first places where scientists became the sort of central stars of the narrative. I mean, Soviet science, for all its batty bits, its Lysenko biology madnesses and so on, was nonetheless pretty advanced and scientists were national heroes in a way that took a long time for scientists to become national heroes in the West, though that's the case now, I suppose. Yeah, so I think science tr- is still tremendously respected worldwide, certainly in the West. Um, and the scientists in the Soviet Union led the way. We still They still wrote textbooks that we all uh, read and admire tremendously. Um, I do think that one of the very interesting things, particularly in the Soviet Union, is how they try to take science and apply it to something that seemed slightly non-scientific, really a misapplication of science. And in some ways, the downfall of the Soviet Union, particularly as we, as you know, you describe in, in your book, um, was um, an example of uh, taking something that is very, very complex and really applying so many interesting new technologies to it, the computer, for example. And look, there was a tremendous computer revolution in the end. Look, look our lives are totally changed by it, but not in the way that no. they uh, no. that they intended. Yeah, you know, I get. I guess in a way, it it had to stand for religion and so much else. Scientific histor- you know, the historical approach was scientific. Everything was scientific. Science would answer everything. Yeah, I think. I think you have a, a kind of a religious narrative in which there's a scientific m- march towards the towards the kingdom of the kingdom of plenty. Um, and yes, a lot of this is is a is a kind of overconfidence in what science can do. A deep respect for science, but then. Which, which mistakes the kind of thing an economy is, which is mm. a it's a big, complicated, chaotic system, um, and it doesn't really optimize terribly well. Treating it treating it as a as, as the opportunity for one big computer program appears not to be very well mm. intellectually founded. But there's a kind of there's a kind of generosity in thinking that might have worked. Yeah. Well, let's move now from um, the Soviet Union in the fifties and sixties a little further back and paint a picture of Egypt as it appears at the beginning of Tarek Osman's book, sort of around about 100 years ago, Tarek, where it is one of the most cosmopolitan, culturally liberal, exciting, unusual places on the planet, really, with those fantastic sort of boulevards uh, through Cairo and Alexandria, uh, and a sense that this is going to be one of the great rising powers of the world. Uh, absolutely. Actually, one of the... One of the themes I start the book with is if, you, if you're an observer or a visitor to Cairo or Alexandria in the 30s or the 40s mm. uh, or even in the early 50s mm. of the last century, and if you were to envisage what would be the, the future of that country or society, most likely uh, most observers would have guessed uh, a different future than the next 50 or 60 years for mm. Egypt and certainly different from today's mm. Egypt in almost every respect. The character who is central, really, to your book, and um, it's hard sometimes reading through the book to know whether you really regard him as a complete hero or a bit of a hero, a bit of a villain, whatever, is NASA, um, known obviously in this country and in the West as, you know, for the, the, the Suez crisis and so on, and portrayed at the time in the British press as a kind of Arab Hitler, we should remember, um, but yet seen as the, you know, the great hope for modern Egyptian nationalism and indeed for Arab nationalism around the world. Nasser has, he himself was, was, was a historical phenomenon for one simple reason. Since the fall of the last pharaonic uh, dynasty, he's the first Egyptian to rule Egypt, Gosh. which I found yeah. fascinating, yeah. really. <laughs> so if, if you just very quickly trace... Since it, Alexander the Great's guys had, had, had rolled into town. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Since Alexander the Great up to King Farouk, who, uh, who abdicated or forced to abdicate in 1952, 
Not a single Egyptian has ruled Egypt since then. So you can imagine mm. at that time, 20 or 22 million Egyptians, most of them farmers and peasants, very poor, really subjugated under centuries and centuries of foreign rule. And then you have this tall, dark man coming, saying, we will rejuvenate the Egyptian nation, mm. stand up to the foreign powers, British at that time and the rising America at that time. He grabbed the admiration, not only of the Egyptians, of loads and millions all over the Arab world. And then obviously came the Suez crisis that you referred to. And then, not really because of his genius, but international circumstances result in what appear to be uh, a strategic victory against the older <coughs> masters of Britain and France. So he is catapulted, really, to a new status. And the, although it wasn't Soviet Union-sized, his vision of a united Arab world was pretty gigantic, too. I mean, he really wanted to draw in uh, Iraq and Syria and the Lebanon and, and, and further south as well into this massive... Uh, Arab bloc or Arab supernation, didn't he? And absolutely, and surprisingly, I mean, today that might sound a bit funny or, or, or certainly a dreamy uh, mm. picture, but at that time, especially after Suez, and uh, people sometimes forget, Nasser visited Syria in '58. Roughly one third of the Syrian population, not the Damascus population, mm. not people of Damascus, literally came out. To, to greet him. His car was literally carried off the roads. It, it was a moment of, um, of rejuvenation, if you'd like, or seen so and throughout the world. And then he turns to the Soviet Union and its allies to help modernise Egypt, these massive, massive industrial projects, which the Aswan Dam is the most well-known, but, but, but many more, huge factories and so on. Uh, across many economic sectors, loads of factories uh, were built by funds from the Soviet Union, engineers from the Soviet Union. At one point in time, in the late 60s, there were more than 7,000 Soviet engineers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there. And so, so I suppose the simple question is what went wrong? Because Egypt now is, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, as you say, it's on the brink. It's on the, we don't quite know what it's on the brink of, but it's certainly it's got a rising militant, uh, militancy from, from some of the Muslim parties and this kind of decaying, bureaucratic, semi-military autocracy. I think many things went wrong. Uh, every single experiment, unfortunately, in Egypt over the past 60 or 70 years has gone wrong. Um, very quickly, the liberal experiment of the first half of the 20th century failed. Nasser's experiment failed, I argue in the book, not only because it was very much a dream, but also because the man and his regime <coughs> failed to build institutions uh, that can mm. support that experiment or that dream. What came after him failed. Sadat came with a completely opposite view in terms of economics, in terms of how the society should function, in terms of Egypt's region, region role. And that also failed. And the man himself was assassinated live on TV. Yeah. Um, and then the last 30 years under President Mubarak has been also a very different story. Many people would say quite disappointing story. He's your Brezhnev, I thought, in a way, Mubarak. <laughs> I'll not go into the, <laughs> the Soviet comparison. But it's, it's it, it, you know, he's the aged leader under which everything sort of just ticks along um, without, without reform, without changing very much. He keeps the lid on everything. He and his son are keeping the lid down. I think, f fair point, but I, I would say there are two stories during the last 30 years, and very briefly, one of them is the story of the military continuing to dominate the country, mm. obviously. Uh, and we have to remember that President Mubarak, unlike Sadat, unlike uh, Nasser, is the only president for Egypt who has spent 30 or 35 years of his career as a professional soldier, from a graduate until field marshal. Um, but there's another story under Mubarak which is very different to, to, the, to the military side, which is the rise of capitalism in Egypt. Uh, today, if you look at the regime, it's very difficult to say it is the military that rules Egypt full stop. Certainly. Mubarak's son is very involved in the sort of capitalist side, as it were, the, the business and money-making side. Absolutely. But I think there is a fascination or a focus by international media on Gamal Mubarak as a person, while the reality is that he is part of a web of financial and economic interests that um, 
mm. now have a leading role in the regime. There's a blur of the lines between wealth and power in Egypt, which is very unprecedented, quite, quite uh, unprecedented in the last 60, 70 years. Elif, I was thinking that in terms of parts of the, the Mediterranean, that end of the Mediterranean, trying to modernise and find different routes for modernisation, the parallels and contrasts between Egypt and Turkey are very interesting because in both cases, you know, there, there are elements of democracy and there are, you know, democratic parties and, and, um, and at the same time there's this quite aggressive nationalism. Um, I should say, I mean, you've, you've, you fell foul of, the, of, of some of the laws about uh, insulting Turkey, didn't you, uh, in the past? That's a tough question. I think there are parallels. Um, but nevertheless, I would say that Turkey is a very uh, unique case, you know, mm. in many ways. When I look at the Muslim world in general, not only the Middle East, but the, 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 the Muslim uh, world in, in, in broader terms, I think many of, many of the things we see in Turkey are very, very sui generis. You know, they're very, very unique. This also is related to the country's past, the country's history. Of course, six, 600 years of Ottoman rule. Yes. Turkey was never a colony, you know. Which well, is, Turkey ruled Egypt. Let's remember, well, the Ottomans ruled Egypt. I think yes. it's very important years. because in, 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 years, in, yeah. many, in many countries in, in which, um, you know, Western powers have ruled, we see more fierce nationalism or more fierce anti-Western, you know, sentiments over time. So such things did not did not take place in, in Turkey. And in many ways, I think the Turkish civic society is amazingly colourful. Mm. So, um, all, of course, there, there could be parallels, there could be similarities, but nevertheless, I would say the differences in my eye, in well, my eyes, in, are, are heavier. One of, one of the sort of themes of, of what we're talking about seems to me that determinism should be avoided, that it, a lot of these things are about the individual characters thrown up, whether it's uh, Khrushchev or Kosygin, mm -hmm. um, or the fact of having Kemal Ataturk, uh, who radically westernised and changed the alphabet in Turkey, mm -hmm. as against NASA, um, you know, a few decades later, makes mm -hmm. all the difference. The, yeah, it, um, let, 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 me, let me put it this way, if, 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 I, if I may uh, introduce. Um, I think in Turkey... Of course, with Atatürk, there was a huge transformation. But the, the process of westernization started much earlier. And this is something we sometimes fail to remember. I mean, it started with uh, Selim III, who was called the Reform Sultan, you know, 1789, when he mm. came to throne, when he ascended the throne. So that's very interesting. I mean, you have such a long period of westernization, modernization. It is an elite project. And yet at the same time, the civic society has evolved more in Tarek. Turkey. Uh, I, th I, I think in Egypt also one of the, the key problems which um, makes it a unique case is that there wasn't a continuing story in Egypt over the past 150 years. So you had Muhammad Ali who started, Muhammad Ali Pasha as he's known in the West, mm -hmm. who started the, the new Egypt, who, who's an Ottoman soldier or who was an Ottoman soldier. His story took 40, 50 years um, and then ended abruptly. And then the new monarchs, Farouk and his, mm -hmm. his time, very liberal experiment, ended abruptly. And then Nasser, new dream, very different from what came before it, 17, 18 years, ended abruptly with a military failure in 67 and then really uh, bankruptcy of the whole experiment, unfortunately. And then 10 years after said that, mm. completely the opposite view, abruptly. Whereas Tur Turkey has had one narrative well, in a sense. Yeah, sort of one continue. narrative. Continue. Francis. One of the things I got from Tarek's book was, was a sense of, of what a loss it's been to Egypt for the, the liberal order of things which was around in the early 20th century to have gone with NASA, that understandable and admirable though NASA was in, in many ways. There were a set of kind of constitutional tools that, that early 20th century Egypt had which have been gone since, and it's kind of hard to see from your book how, the, how, how, they, how they're going to come back, given that for the last 30 or 40 years kind of political and economic and religious developments have been have been moving along together so that one reason for the rise of, of Islamism as I, as I read your book is that as 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 the state and the political class move towards kind of um, free markets there's actually a huge gap for social services which the Muslim Brotherhood have rushed in to fill for example absolutely true and if you look at the last 30 40 years the the leading story in Egypt is the rise of Islamism however if you look today there are some positive developments still very early on but positive <coughs> developments. For example, the rise of the private sector. This is the first time in the last 60, 70 years that the private sector now employs more Egyptians than the government, than the 
yeah. public sector, and this is new. The civic society, as as Elif has just mentioned, has or is witnessing a revival after many years of being demonized, really, by by the mosque and the church, by the religious mm. establishment on mm. both sides. Education is seeing many interesting developments in Egypt. Well, one of the things that I do think um, links links Egypt and Turkey, obviously, is the position of novelists in the sense that historically, uh, Egyptian novelist Mahfouz won winning the Nobel Prize and so on, incredibly important in the culture. And the same would be true in Turkey, where novelists have had a much more important role um, with with respect <laughs> to Francis and others um, than than they've played in the West. I think in terms of of um, how the country thinks of itself, but that's a kind of burden as well. I, w- I would suspect. Do you think? Do you think that is? That's I think it is? has, you know, two two sides. Uh, on the one hand, let me make a very broad, you know, comparison. When I look at America, for instance, so many books are being published every every year, but I tend to think they evaporate so fast. You know, mm. however, in Turkey, um, novels do not evaporate that fast. A novelist is always more than a novelist. A novelist is a public figure. A uh, writer is a public figure. I think part of the story goes again back to the Ottoman era because um, late Ottoman writers, and most of them, many of them, were, of course, men. You know, They saw themselves as father novelists. They wanted to show the right and the wrong. They wanted to direct their readers uh, to the right path. Mm. So they, wrote, they were men with, with missions. They wrote with a mission. We have this sense of... Um, this idea that novelists can, you know, um, c- can can lead the way, can 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 be guides, can be, you know, men with opinions. Which so means that, what you say about whether it might be Armenians or whatever it might be, or the condition of of democracy in Turkey, mm-hmm. you become instantly a public figure, um, mm-hmm. and what you say matters very much, and a little bit like in a, in a much gentler way, mm-hmm. uh, Soviet novelists or poets in the past, you can be arraigned and hauled up in front of courts because of what you've said, because it matters so much. I think that's only you know a, a very small small part of the of the picture mm-hmm. and I would rather look at the bigger picture mm-hmm. you know and I think there's an amazingly lively and dynamic literary uh, environment in Turkey is there Precisely, a storytelling culture that there, is there livelier is a, than the West? There's a very vivid there's a very rich you know um, storytelling culture and I'm always amazed by this because especially the oral culture it's very much dominated by women whereas when I look at written culture it's very much dominated by men you know literary critics editors writers poets mostly men now, when I look at the people who read these fiction, you know, the novels, it's mostly women. So it's like women read, but men write. And this is something that I would like to see changing. Mm. But what I'm trying to say is most of these readers in Turkey, women readers, they take stories very seriously. And that when they like, if they like a story, when they like a book, they give it to their grandmother, they give it to their aunts. I've never seen anything like this in any other places, really. When I, in my, you know, book signings, when they bring me books, I realize the same book has been read by maybe six or seven different people. They've been underlining different sentences with different colors. Mm. Uh, this is something very emotional. So what I'm trying to say is there's also a lot of inspiration. You get a lot of inspiration in Turkey as a writer. And there's also that side of the picture. Mm. Do you think that um, uh, Mafus himself, who won the, won the Nobel Prize, as I said, said that uh, once he said, in all my writings you'll find politics. You may find a story which ignores love or any other subject, but not politics. And in a sense, I suppose that's what you're saying, that the problem has been in Turkey too. Too much um, politics, too not m- enough of the rest of the life. That is, that is true. I mean, politics <laughs> is important. and Unfortunately, sometimes things become very quickly politicized. More than that, they become very quickly polarized, you know. Mm. And that's, that makes it more difficult, you know, to to take things lightly. You know, it, it, it lessens the, the scope of humor in life. Yes. Um, but that said, there's also a very rich tradition of black humor. You know, black political humour, which which I take very mm. seriously as well. So there's in, the different sides. Yeah. In your last book, The Forty Rules of Love, which is um, another bestseller, um, one of the characters, um, who is himself a novelist, um, says that uh, he believes that um, we believe in the freedom and power of the individual these days, regardless of God, government or society. In many ways, human beings are becoming more self-centred and the world is becoming more materialistic. But he says that humanity as a whole is becoming more spiritual. And this is a book about the spiritual. There's a right. Sufi character very right. prominently in the book. And I wondered if that fictional novelist in your novel was also speaking in, in some way for you. That's your view. Um, 
usually you know my work is not autobiographical no. I, but definitely part of my personality my life seeps into the stories but I'm, I'm more interested in creating characters so I like to make a distinction between myself and, and, and the characters but that said I am someone who's very interested in spirituality in, in, in general and this again has been one of the topics that I found a bit difficult um, maybe to talk about because the moment we, we, we speak about spirituality people immediately think about religion really Religiosity, you know, and then immediately fundamentalism. These things are not the same. We, they can't be lumped together. They're, they're different things. Is that why you chose a Sufi uh, mystic as a, a as a main character in this book from the 1200s? Not somebody much remembered to the rest of the world. I think the Sufi. I think culture. Sufi philosophy, Sufi poetry, Sufi art, Sufi way of thinking in general is very important and it's worth remembering. It's worth, you know, doing more research about it. It has had a tremendous effect, not only on the Islamic world, but I would say the world in general. It is a very introverted, inner oriented, very peaceful, very constructive um, philosophy that uh, has no room for violence, that has no room for aggression. Your, your, the, the basic thing is to deal with your ego, you know, to transform yourself. And in some ways, I found I find parallels between the art of storytelling and sto and Sufism because I think in both the essential quest is to transcend the self that has been given to you and to go beyond those boundaries. Right. I mean, the one point that, or the one example you, you mentioned in Egypt, which is the most famous novelist, of course, uh, in Egypt, Nagib Mahfouz, um, Mahfouz always infiltrated his political views, uh, put, well, infiltrated, put them into his, his, his novels. Um, the question I have for, for Elif is, is, do you believe in this connection between culture and, and, and the writer? I'm asking you the question because I... I Mm -hmm. read some of what you said about that the writer can write about things he or she does not necessarily has lived or has not mm -hmm. necessarily experienced. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, in, in, in my view, and based on, on what uh, Mahfouz has mentioned, mm -hmm. I thought there's this strong link between culture, place, and writer. Absolutely. I, I, uh, you know, I think it's a very important question for me. It's something that I do think about uh, almost on a daily basis there is a there's a metaphor used by Rumi which I like a lot and I think it explains very much what I'm trying to say he talks about living like a drawing compass you know as you know one leg of the drawing compass is very static it's fixed in a territory um, just like that, I like to think of my fiction as having very strong local roots. It is based in Istanbul. It, it's learned so much from the Turkish culture, gets a lot of energy and inspiration from there. However, the other leg of the drawing compass draws a huge wide circle around the first one and travels the world and makes connections with different cultures. At the end of the day, I think the art of storytelling is about connections, <coughs> building connections. Well, we're going to move now to even bigger connections and, yeah. uh, and other kinds of stories. Uh, Vicky Caspi, your talk at the Royal Society, you're calling the cosmic gift of neutron stars. Um, and neutron stars, is that's, that's your particular focus of interest, neutron stars and pulsars. Um, and they are mysterious things, neutron stars. Just tell us a little bit about them to start with. Well, um, they're a very exotic form of star, very much unlike our own sun, which of course is a star. It's the remnant of uh, our the most massive stars, typically 10 to 30 times the mass of the sun, which uh, have uh, ended their lives and collapsed in upon themselves to form a, a tiny little star, only 10 kilometers across, but containing uh, as much mass, in fact, we think up to 40 or 50 percent more mass than the sun, crushed into you know very human dimension, only 10 kilometers across. And just try and give us some sense of, of, of the massness of that mass. I mean, what would a small quantity of it mean? Yes, well, it, it's tremendous densities. The matter in neutron stars has been uh, crushed so that there's no space between electrons and neutrons anymore. If you went to a neutron star and took a teaspoonful of it, it would weigh something like a billion tons. <laughs> not, not matter like we have here on Earth. And these, and, and these collapsed stars are, we think, all around us, on, uh, th throughout the universe. Uh, well, um, in fact, the, the light that they produce is quite faint, and we can only see them mainly in our own Milky Way galaxy. So 
we only see the ones that are closest to us, and uh, they mm. tend to be in the disk of our galaxy, mm. mainly. And so what is a pulsar, then? Uh, a pulsar is one type of neutron star uh, that rotates quite rapidly and has um, a very large magnetic field uh, that is uh, pointed, uh, that is misaligned with the spin axis, much like the uh, Earth's magnetic pole is not at the mm. geographic pole. And uh, they produce light. They produce beams of radiation from their magnetic poles that we see as a flash of light each time the star turns. Which can be incredibly fast. I mean, the... Yes, that's true. Uh, the, uh, some neutron stars rotate several hundred times every second. And we see these as flashes of light uh, hundreds of times per second, which we uh, detect using uh, mm -hmm. supercomputers. So we're dealing with unimaginable speeds, unimaginable dense densities, hard to imagine um, uh, periods of, uh, of space. Why should we be interested in all of this? I mean, it, uh, beyond wanting to know what's out there in, a, in an abstract way, what does it tell us? Well, it, it is a little hard to connect uh, the uh, utility of neutron stars with what we've been discussing so <laughs> far. Uh, but uh, that said, they are quite useful, certainly um, in for, for science overall and physics in particular. So they're useful astronomically for understanding the evolution of stars, how stars live, their end products, uh, and so forth. But uh, these uh, so they're pulses. part of universal history in terms of the, yeah. the narrative. Yes, that's a mm. that's a wonderful way to put yeah. it. Um, but they're also uh, tremendous laboratories for doing uh, for studying extreme physics, physics that is inaccessible in terrestrial laboratories. So, for example, these stars are excellent clocks because they rotate very regularly. You could easily set your watch to it. In fact, you could set your most atomic clocks uh, to them. And as such, because they have these beams of radiation that are bright enough for us to see on Earth, they are tremendous beacons of uh, precision timing across the galaxy. We can see them in uh, we can detect their motion through their Doppler shifts, but we could, we could see how they move very, very precisely, and then we can do um, very detailed tests of uh, different physical theories, such as uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity. And so if we know precisely where they are, and, and, and are they also potentially one day, if we're, we have spacecraft out there, a way of finding your way around the universe? Yes, they've been suggested uh, uh, that they could be used as navigational beacons. The, the mm. rotation rate is so steady that you could orient yourself uh, very, very well just by seeing oh, which pulsar is in which direction. You, you would recognize them by their rotation rate. So it, mm. it is possible. I, I believe there's even a patent out on that. <laughs> um, this was... Um, uh, people have, of course, always looked at the stars, and you know we're, we were talking about the, the Sufi world and the, the old Islamic world, where there was massive amount of effort put into stargazing because people thought it would tell you about the future um, and give you a bit of hard evidence. How difficult is it to to fund this work these days, or do all big governments? Um, we know the United States puts a lot of money into astrophysics, but is it hard because it's presumably very, very expensive to get the kit to do this? Uh, yes, well, so astronomy, like many areas of physics, um, has become a science where, where big dollars are required. We, uh, we do need big telescopes in order to make progress, uh, to be able to see ever further out. Uh, and um, funding for very, very large projects uh, is, is certainly a, a challenge, particularly in these economic times. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, um, once one large facility is built, many, many people can use it. For the Hubble Space Telescope has been used by uh, you know, hundreds mm. or thousands of astronomers over the years and has lasted qu quite a long time. So once these things are built, they're uh, quite useful for making progress, and uh, there is enough scientific funding, at least I can speak of Canada and the United States, uh, that, that may, allows us to uh, yeah. make progress. Francis Spufford. Um, I want to speak up for a minute for, for Arab astronomers because it, it's not an accident the sky is full of Arabic star names. Um, sure. Elder Baran and Deneb and Rigel are all Arabic names. But, Vicky, do I remember rightly that, that pulsars get discovered as a strange byproduct, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, that 
there's, there's that there's that moment when when they find a regular signal sometime in the 50s or 60s and think think aha somebody is signaling to us but then it turns out to be an early early discovery of pulsar so well so you you're quite right the the first discovery of pulsars in 1967 which was actually done uh here in in Britain uh at Cambridge University uh, at first it was such a startling um signal from the sky you don't expect something to be going regularly beep 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 in the sky. It was thought initially that these were uh, extraterrestrial intelligent signals, uh, but that theory was quickly thrown away when it was realized they were confined to the galactic plane for the most part, and that there's so many on the sky that it really couldn't be a natural uh, phenomenon. And and today, sort of that, you, you encounter that kind of uh, um, uh, picture sometimes in pop culture, for example, in the movie Contact, starring Jodie Foster uh, when they're looking for extraterrestrials and they see something going beep, beep, beep. They see a pattern. And initially get very excited. They say, oh, no, it's just a pulsar, which to me is really Just a pulsar. Exactly. You think, don't say <laughs> just a pulsar. <laughs> it's a pulsar. Yeah, it's quite, quite upsetting to me. Have you discovered pulsars yourself? Certainly, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that, so it's, it's, and you sort of notch up. I mean, is there a kind of league table? That... <laughs> That Vicky Caspi, she's she, she she's she's got twenty pulsars under her belt. Is we it, we it? tend to work in teams. It's it's a team effort. It's not an easy thing to do, and uh, uh, we don't we don't put little notches on our on lipstick cases or, or things like. We're certainly not the males, uh, but in any case, um, uh, no, it's it's a team effort. Um, we we are all interested in advancing the cause and finding new algorithms, new uh, ways of using supercomputers in clever, faster ways in order to do this particularly ch- challenging problem and perhaps also apply it in uh, in other cases. Yeah, so in, in a sense, my sort of crudely materialistic question, what's it for, or deterministic question, what it is, is it's the, it, it is one of the last boundaries that people on the planet are really staring at, not knowing what they're going to discover. It's, it's, it's about looking. A- absolutely. It's, it, it's a scientific curiosity, just pure and simple. Uh, but at the same time, it allows us to push the boundaries of engineering and computing and find new ways to do th- prop to, to accomplish problems that uh, really we don't encounter on a daily basis. Well, we're never against pure pure thinking on this program. Thank you to all my guests. We've now run out of time. Elif Shaf, Shafak is presently writer in residence at Kingston University, I should say, and her latest novel, as we mentioned, is Forty Rules of Love. You can see Vicky Casper is extolling the cosmic gift of neutron stars this very evening at the Royal Society in London. Anne Francis Spufford's Red Plenty and Tarek Osman's Egypt on the Brink are in good bookshops and probably bad bookshops as well. (laughs) Now, (laughs) next week we're going to be doing a little pas de deux with Matthew Bourne and the dance critic Jennifer Homans talking about the history of ballet. Uh, We've also got David Aronovich of The Times and Jane Haynes talking about Freud and Proust. What could be better? For now, goodbye. Ever to win the Nobel Prize for Economics. Lots and lots of physicists and, and mathematicians, um, but very few economists. He, he came up independently at, at, a, at a dark moment of, of, of Stalinism with a piece of mathematics which um, is in use all over the world now, improving the operations of, of multinational companies, for example. But he thought it was the secret to making a planned economy purr along like a, like a, like a finely tuned machine. It was about op- optimal inputs and outputs, how to get the most out of the least, as it were. It was. It was a, it was a, a way of introducing or reintroducing frugality into into the planned economy, a way of finding a logic inside it which could be, which could be exploited to to get to get more from the same or or the same from from less and it actually got political backing um, during the Khrushchev time, and it looked for a while as if it was going to become the basis for a, for a new mathematical cybernetic Soviet Union um, and my book is partly about why who has gone through the ghastly years of the sort of the famines and the slaughters and the massacres and who hopes it will be worth it. It's important to remember that he's someone who, who, who partly caused the ghastly years of the famines and the slaughters. What, what fascinates me about Khrushchev is that he appears to be that very rare thing, a monster with, a, with an intact conscience. Um, mm. And I think he, he, he dreamed of and, and yearned for and committed the country to, to utopia, partly as a way of 
settling his internal moral scores with himself, the future had to be wonderful because it was the only thing which would justify the past. I've broken all those eggs, so it better be one heck of an omelette that we're producing. Exactly. Um, it, Soviet omelette making committed to 300% <laughs> improvement under Khrushchev. Uh, now, explain to us, just to draw us a little picture of your, uh, I suppose, main anti-hero or hero, um, who you describe as a genius. He was a genius. This is a man called Leonid Vitalievich Kantorovich, who was the only Soviet citizen that didn't happen. And it didn't happen, really, because of the politics of a cruddy regime. Yes, um, because... I put it simply. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to disagree with you. I think the Soviet Union was a horrible country, and, and um, a horrible country with gleams of idealism in it, which have to be, to be accounted for. Basically, they were they were they were stuffed because they had committed themselves under under Stalin to a form of industrialization, which was hopelessly intrinsically tyrannical, and they could not really change the software. The hardware was such that you could not run clever, delicate, um, intellectual little programmers for producing consumer plenty on it. Steel, concrete, yes, musical boxes, and and happy ever after, no. And it's a book where you have all sorts of... You have the young lovers and you have um, private life appears and all the rest of it, and you have a, a singer-songwriter who's morally uh, corrupted and so on. But for a novel, you've got... He homes in on that moment in the late 1950s, early 1960s, when diplomatic messages were discussing the possibility that the Soviets were about to overtake the West, not merely in missiles, but in consumer goods as well. Uh, Francis, it was a sort of now forgotten moment, certainly in the West, but it wasn't just in the West that there was this sense of optimism. Russians felt it too. Um, yes, I think it was it was real optimism. Um, partly, it was just Russians comparing a better present with a with a truly grim recent past. Um, but because of that, I think they were willing just for a little while to 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 believe the regime's promises that the future would go on getting better and better and better until it reached something like the kind of the dream of plenty which which Marx had described, an end to history in which in which everyone would have so much of enough they didn't even have to measure it anymore. Yeah, and you, um, you, you feature Khrushchev himself as a rather sympathetic character in many ways in this book. Somebody, Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4. Hello. As the world digests the WikiLeaks revelations about Washington's secret nightmares, dreams and hopes, we're going to be reflecting on the world as it might have been and messages in bottles from unfamiliar places. Later on, we're going to hear from one of the new stars of the Turkish novel, the best-selling Elif Shafak, about spiritual dreams and from the astrophysicist Vicky Caspi about pulsars and neutron stars leaking light messages from deep space. But we're going to start with two of the countries still of enough interest to US diplomats to feature in those WikiLeaks leaks. Egypt's ruler Hosni Mubarak's quoted as inveighing against the liars of Iran. But Egypt itself was once thought to be a rising power in the region. Tariq Osman, author of Egypt on the Brinks, with me to discuss what went wrong. And we're going to start with Russia. Francis Spufford's novel Red Plenty.